We're so glad you joined us online this morning, Parkview. Get comfortable where you are and join us as we worship.
First Timothy 4.10 says, That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. We celebrate communion together, remembering the action of God on our behalf, on behalf of every person in the world, extending grace through the blood of Jesus on the cross, a gift that is made available to every person everywhere to choose whether or not they will believe in Jesus and accept it. And together, we remember that sacrifice of Jesus as we Take a piece of bread or cracker and eat it together. Remember the body of Christ that was broken on the cross and take a cup reminding us of the blood of Christ that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Would you please take those emblems and share with me in the Lord's Supper? Let's pray. God, I thank you for the grace that you extend, for the hope that you provide to us for the opportunity we have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to accept the forgiveness and grace that is available to us through him. And God, I thank you for the relationship that you provide to us. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'd like to encourage you to continue worshiping with giving tithes, gifts, and offerings. If you'd like to do that, you can follow the link on our website to our online giving platform. You can send a check into the church, or you can text to give. It's amazing to me to think about how much of my personality was determined at a very young age. My habits, decisions, and character are rooted in the way I was brought up and the experiences that I have had between here and there. Now, as a child, I lived in a house with very clear rules. I was required to do chores. Some of them I loved and some of them I didn't like so much. When I had the opportunity to help dad mow the grass. We had a riding lawnmower and I was excited to get out there and cruise the lawn on that bad boy. It was so fun. But when we came inside, I hated the idea of cleaning bathrooms and washing dishes and doing laundry. And yet those responsibilities were clearly spelled out. And even though I pushed back against those rules sometimes, having to live up to those responsibilities, having to live within those boundaries was beneficial to my upbringing. I remember that my mom even taught me how to iron my own clothes at a very early age. I think the reason was because I would very often come to her in the morning before school with a shirt and say, would you please iron this right now? Stop what you're doing so that I can get to school on time. And as soon as I learned how to do my own ironing, it became my responsibility to iron my own clothes. And that produced in me A very particular, I don't want to say obsession, but a very particular desire to have clothes without wrinkles in them. And if I happen to get a shirt out of the closet and there are wrinkles in there from being mushed up against other clothes, I don't feel right leaving the house until I have ironed my shirt and removed the wrinkles from it. There have been a few times that Becca has offered to iron clothes for me and I try and politely decline. When we were first married, she ironed some of my shirts and I pulled one out of the closet and put it on and said, oh, thank you. And then I went and ironed the shirt again so that I could leave the house uh, without wrinkles in my, in my shirt and feel good about the way I looked. And while I, there may not have been wrinkles in my shirt, there were some wrinkles that I had to iron out with my wife. It's significant for us to think about how much our childhood has made an impact on who we are today. It gives us incentive to think about how our lives will continue to have an impact on who we become and to make specific decisions about laying the groundwork here and now so that we can become the kind of person that we want to become in the future. The habits, decisions, the character that we practice today will become a natural part of our personality in time will help us develop into that kind of person. As we look into the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy, we'll see how Paul guided Timothy to use this knowledge to his advantage, how Paul guided him to live up to the potential of his youth and begin practicing the life and faith 
that he was stepping into as the leader of the church. We're going to begin reading together in the first verse of chapter 4. If you want to open your Bible and read along with me, the words will be here on the screen. They're also available in the Version app. Let's begin reading together. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Now here, Paul emphasized the need to eliminate false teaching. Now this emphasis may seem a little repetitive to you. In the three weeks that we've been studying 1 Timothy, the first four chapters now of 1 Timothy, we have heard this message from Paul in each of these sermons to watch out for false teaching, to identify the false teaching, to eliminate it from the church and to focus on the truth about Jesus Christ. Now, Repetition is a literary device that was used in Scripture. When Jesus repeated a word, the very next thing that he said was significant. Truly, truly, I say unto you. When Paul uses repetition, he doesn't repeat a word, he will repeat a phrase. And as you're reading through Paul's writing, you'll identify the same sentence, the same phrase, again and again. And when you do that, it is a clear indication that what he's saying is significant and important. Now, highlighters were hard to come by then. Instead of highlighting this important phrase, Paul repeated it in the way that he wrote. And it helps us to identify the importance that he is placing on the need to remove this false teaching and to correct the doctrine of the church and align it with the truth of God's word. False teaching Paul said, causes people to abandon the faith so that they can follow other teachings. Now, that sounds like a very harsh commentary. You and I don't often think of abandoning our faith when we think about other truths, even when those other truths come from different belief systems or different explanations of Scripture that may not line up with the truth of God's Word. We think of those as just different ways of looking at the world. And we've been conditioned to believe that there are many different things that can be true or that are true. And we stack those up with our faith and overlay them with what we have come to learn about the Bible. And there's danger there because we don't see this as an abandoning of our faith. We simply see it as a change of perspective. And as we listen to these other things, as we hear these other voices, we slowly turn by degrees away from the truth of God's word. And we keep turning until one day we realize that we have turned our back, that we have abandoned the truth of God's word without even realizing what we've done because it's been such a slow process. Paul is warning Timothy and the believers of the church at Ephesus to be careful about buying into the false teaching that will cause them to abandon their faith and follow after these teachings that come from deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. In fact, Paul described those teachers who continue to draw people away from the faith as hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Oh, that's very descriptive. It's very illustrative of, of the, the thing that's happening here. But it's hard for us to, to really get a good picture of what it is to have a conscience seared. Now, I've used the word seared in different ways throughout my life. One of those ways is, is when I grill. I love to grill. And, and when I'm cooking a piece of meat, sometimes it's important to sear the outside of that meat so that it will seal that meat up and keep the juices on the inside, keep the meat tender. Another way that I've used the word sear is in the process of ironing clothes. When I learned how to do that as a, as a young man, I would stretch out the cloth on the ironing board and occasionally... I would move my arm just a little bit too far and touch the bottom of the iron, the hot plate that's on the bottom, and burn myself. And immediately there was to be a searing of the flesh, a shiny spot, a burn that would come up. And depending on how long I touched that iron, if it was just a quick touch, it would be a very mild burn. But if I didn't realize what was happening until my, my flesh was against the iron for a second or two, then that burn would be very severe. Sometimes a blister would form. Sometimes a scar would form there because of the damage that was done from the hot iron searing my flesh. The last 
image that I have of searing is of what happens to cattle when they're branded. Now, my wife's great-grandmother uh, was a rancher in Sarasota County, the Triangle Ranch uh, owned by the Carltons, and they would take a branding iron and put it in a fire until it was glowing red hot, and then take that branding iron out and press it on the hide of the cattle. And that branding iron would mark the cattle with this identifier, the symbol that represented the Triangle Ranch. And all the people around in the community and in the surrounding area knew what that identifying mark meant. If that, if that animal was in, at the market, they could easily say, well, this one came from the Triangle Ranch. If one of the cattle happened to get loose, anyone around could recognize it and return it to them. It was a clear identifier, not only of where that animal came from, but where it belonged, to whom it belonged. Now, if you consider the image of having your conscience seared with a hot iron, we can apply that image a little bit more clearly, that there is a sealing that might take place as truth would no longer filter into your conscience. What's inside is inside, what's outside is outside, and there's nothing that's passing through that outer layer. Or potentially, there is a burn that's taking place. And that burn is deadening the sensitivity. And wherever that scar shows up, whether it's a blister or a scar or simply just a, a sear that's going to go away, for a while, that, that place doesn't feel the way it used to. And when our consciences are seared, it makes us less sensitive to sin. It makes us less aware of the things that are causing da danger for our spiritual lives. And we can sometimes step into some dangerous ground because we're not aware of those barriers and boundaries. And finally, when our conscience has been seared like with a branding iron, it identifies where we belong and to whom we belong, what truth we've been following. And those identifying marks are permanent. They don't easily go away. Having your conscience seared means there's damage there. And that false teaching was creating a lot of damage in the church at Ephesus. Paul identified legalism as the content of that false teaching. The danger of legalism is setting up rules and boundaries and laws and claiming that they are from God, truth from God's word, when in fact it is simply the layers of instructions that someone has brought up. Jesus spoke against the legalism of the Pharisees who laid on a heavy burden of law to the Jews. We need to be careful in our lives not to surpass the guidelines of Scripture and claim that those rules and laws are coming from God. That was the danger in the church at Ephesus, that there were people there forbidding others to get married, forbidding people from eating certain foods. And it was creating a lot of difficulty in the relationship of the people of the church and the Lord. They were confused. They were conflicted about what they should do and how they should live. Now, there are times in life where it's important for us to set up boundaries, protective barriers in regard to sin, especially in areas of sin where we might be more tempted than other people, where we might have failed in the past. It's important for us to set up boundaries to keep us from falling to that same sin again. But it is never appropriate for us to impose those boundaries on other people or to claim that that extra protection, that extra caution that we choose to use is necessary for other people as well. God's word provides clear boundaries for us so that we can live within his will in the freedom of knowing that we are living faithfully devoted to him, in the freedom of the joy of those experiences that also fall within his will, in the freedom of knowing that we have been forgiven and grace has been applied. And when we give thanks to God for all of the blessings that he has provided for us, we recognize just how much joy there is in living for the Lord. Now, Paul continued in verse six with more instructions for Timothy. He said, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished in the truths of faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. 
This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all people and especially of those who believe. Paul's instructions were for Timothy to develop a healthy life of faith. And here in these instructions, there is a strong connection between faith and life. And Paul used two clear examples to help Timothy understand his point. In verse six, Paul said that Timothy would be nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that he had followed. Now the truth is sustenance for the soul. It provides the nourishment that's needed to develop a healthy life of faith. In the same way that truth provides healthy food that our soul needs, false teaching will deteriorate our faith and the faith of those who consume it, like junk food. When we entertain these ideas that pull us away from faith, that that cause us to abandon our faith, to follow these other teachings, we try to supplement the word of God with other perspectives. We end up watering down the truth and contaminating our food supply. And this will produce a faith that lacks the strength and endurance to live for the Lord. Then in, verse, in verses seven and eight, Paul introduced the second example, connecting faith with life by saying that Timothy needed to train himself to be godly in the same way that an athlete would train themselves to get in shape or to prepare for a sport. So, we think we want to get our faith in shape, we need to begin training by selecting the exercises that will do us the most good. Spiritual disciplines are the workouts of faith. They help us to grow closer to the Lord. And each discipline will help us to develop a different aspect of our faith. As we practice them, we become more natural. They become a a natural response in our lives. They become part of who we are. Like any workout, as we begin exercising, these disciplines, it'll feel like work. It'll, it'll be difficult. We'll have to, to set aside time and force ourselves to, to dedicate attention to those specific practices. But as we continue to make them a regular part of our day, we'll notice a change. As faith grows and becomes stronger, those exercises that once felt like work will soon leave us feeling energized and alive. We'll begin looking forward to those times that we can spend connecting with God and being molded and shaped through the practice of these disciplines. When we carve out time to read the word of God, to pray, to contemplate in silence and solitude, to practice tithing and giving and generosity and sharing the gospel and fasting and living in accountability, seeking simplicity, we will be enabled to experience the fullness of life that God intends for us as we strengthen our faith and grow in our ability. These exercises will need to be practiced. They'll need to be repeated. They'll need to be developed in our lives. We need to ingrain them into us so that they're second nature, an automatic reflex or reaction, so that when times are tough, when things get difficult in the world, we will have a natural response of faith. It'd be second nature and natural and comfortable. You know, just this week, our staff went to play a round of golf with some other ministers in the area. It was a fun day. Really enjoyed spending time with the other guys on staff. But I have to tell you, I played a horrible round of golf. When I was in high school, I learned how to swing a golf club and I could hit the ball pretty straight. And right out of college, my first ministry, I went and played round of golf. It was easy. It was fun. It was natural. And I enjoyed it between here and there. Something happened. I lost the feeling of that swing. And when we went out to play this week, it had been years since I've touched a set of golf clubs. And for some reason, I thought that I could just walk out onto the golf course, pick up a club and swing with that natural feel that I I used to have. I know better. I know it was a long shot and uh, prove myself right. Things that were once an easy part of life will slowly become uncomfortable and foreign if we don't use them regularly. Now, if I were to spend an hour every day on the driving range, if I were to go to my backyard and chip golf balls, the feeling of that swing would become more natural and that practice would pay off as I develop muscle memory and honed those specific skills. Faith is a part of our lives that works in very much the same way as those kinds of physical activities. 
if it's something that we use and practice, it will grow and become a more dynamic part of our lives, a, an automatic response an easy and comfortable reaction. But if we ignore it and set it aside while we pursue other things, it will slowly become an irrelevant and uncomfortable part of our lives. And when we find ourselves in a difficult situation, when we try and return to our faith, it won't produce the same kind of result that it once did for us because we have not spent the time developing that part of our lives. Paul continued to instruct Timothy saying, continue to practice, increase in your training. And it's important for us to think that in the same way that we build stamina and strength through physical training, we need to push our faith, exercise our faith, and develop that in our lives. We need to develop muscle memory so that in every circumstance, we can automatically turn to God as a natural response to the environment that we, in, that we are in. Paul then turned Timothy to recognize the value of godliness. Just as training has a very specific, limited application, godliness has value for all things, both here and now and in the life to come. And it's the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ that is the motivation that we need to persevere in these things, to continue training, to continue practicing, drawing closer in our relationship with him because we're filled with hope through the gift that he extends to us of salvation. In verse 11, we read the rest of Paul's instructions here. He said, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in life, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. It's important for us to live as an authentic example of faith. And that's the message that Paul had for Timothy, to live as an authentic example of faith, knowing that he was sending Timothy into an established Ephesian church a church full of people that would have been older than Timothy with more life experience than Timothy. And their natural re reaction to Timothy would be to try and disqualify his advice, to try and look down on the wisdom that he would provide for them and the church and correcting the wrongs and pointing them back to the truth of Jesus Christ. It would be their natural response to look down on him. Paul said, instead of allowing that to happen, I want you to set an example for them to look up to so that they can't look down on you. And Paul provided several areas for Timothy to specifically focus on providing an example of faith. He said, in the way that you speak, set an example of faith. Be what you want the believers at the church to become. And it's important when we want to be an example through our words that we would encourage others, that we would use our words to build others up, to build unity among the believers to speak positively to other people, to speak positively about other people. And that through the example of the way that we speak, we would help others to live up to that example. Paul said in your conduct, be an example of what you want others to become. Let your actions serve others, serve the church and demonstrate what you want to see other people doing, expressing kindness working for the Lord and for his kingdom. He said, in the way that you love, be an example. And it's important for us to be an example of care, of empathy, of goodwill, of benevolence, of kindness, as we think about the needs of the people around us, to express care for them in those needs, to help them understand how God sees them, how much God loves them through the way that we love them. We can be an example and help others live according to this love that's inspired by faith. He said, in your faith, be an example. Show the people around you what spiritual disciplines look like as they're practiced in your life. Show them what a genuine relationship with Jesus looks like as you authentically live out your faith. And then he said, impurity, be an example. And it's important for us to be specific about what we choose to do and also to be very specific about what we decide not to indulge in and to let our lives of purity be an example for others as we strengthen and encourage one another, as we hold each other accountable to strive for godliness and develop our faith in the Lord. Then Paul urged Timothy to be devoted to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. That Timothy would deliberately take time 
to proclaim the word of God, to read it aloud and have others listen, that he would speak the truth about Jesus Christ and deliver that message of salvation, that he would take time to explain the meaning of scripture, to apply the truths that he was talking about in an applicable, meaningful way. Now, I want you to know that these words have had a very significant impact on my ministry. And I have made a decision using this scripture in Acts chapter 2 and several other places to mold and shape my preaching style according to what the Word of God says here, that I would take specific time in our sermons to read the Word of God. You may have noticed that in your experiences here at Parkview, that instead of making a point about the way we should live and then supporting that with a verse from Scripture, I choose rather to read sections of Scripture in context and let the truth of God's Word speak into our lives. And I do this not only because of what God's word says, but because I truly believe in God's word. Because I believe in the authority and accuracy of God's word. I believe that it is the means by which our lives are changed. When we allow the truth of God's word to infiltrate our heart, to invade our mind, it will bring about change in our lives. It will produce in us the kind of actions and speech and conduct and love and faith and purity that we are called to live in. And it's through the public reading of God's word, through the listening to God's word together that we grow in our understanding and our ability to live by scripture. It's important for us to live in that example and to know that that example not only has a bearing on our own life, but it has a, lot, a bearing on the lives of the people around us. Paul then said to Timothy that he should not neglect the gift that he had been given, that he should fulfill the calling of God in his life. And Paul talked about a prophetic message when the elders laid their hands on Timothy. We don't have a place in scripture to look to for this occasion. We don't know when this happened or the, the details or what that message contained, but we do know that Paul continued to push Timothy to lead churches, continue to push Timothy to proclaim the message of truth about Jesus Christ, to stand in front of people and proclaim the word of God, to speak about the truth of Jesus Christ, to, to teach about scripture that Timothy's gift is leadership and proclaiming the word of God. And Paul urged him to fulfill that calling in his life, to fulfill the gift that God had given him and to use it for the kingdom and for God's glory is a clear challenge that Paul made to Timothy, a challenge that we should think about together. And I want to invite you to think with me about how God has gifted you. If you were to identify the most prominent gift, talent, skill, or ability that God has placed in your life, what would that be? It could be something that you have been born with, it's a part of <laughs> your natural ability. It could be something that God has gifted to you by his spirit something that you have developed over time that has become a natural ability for you. But I want you to think about that thing that you are uniquely and amazingly good at. And when you have that in mind, I want to ask you a personal question for you to think about. And here's that question. How would you describe your use of that gift? Have you neglected it? Have you put it aside because you're doing more important things, more urgent things, because there, there are things that are more pressing for your time and maybe you'll get to that gift later? Have you used your gift frequently, but not for the kingdom of God and not for the benefit of others? You've been using it here. Have you found a way to use your gift, to live in your gift and to, to surrender it in service to God and his kingdom, to use it in worship of God to use it for his church and for his kingdom and to reach the community. That's the challenge that we face today, to be diligent and give ourselves wholly to the service of the Lord and to use the gift that God has given us to make his name known, to make his love and grace known in the world around us. And I would challenge you today, this week, to identify your gift. If you need help with that, I would love to, to have a conversation with you and help identify the gift that God has placed in your life. There are leaders at the church, elders, ministry team leaders, 
connect group leaders who would love to have a conversation with you and help identify your gift and help you find a place to use that gift here at Parkview in the kingdom of God to reach the community. We have such incredible opportunity to make an impact in this world, to help others know the love and grace of Jesus Christ, to help them grow in faith and in their relationship with the Lord. I want to challenge you to step into the calling that God has placed in your life. Because I know that he has given you your gift for a reason. And I want to invite you to fulfill that purpose in your life. To live in the joy and fulfillment of using your gifts for his glory. This morning, if you have been impacted by truth that we discussed today, if you recognize the need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to receive the forgiveness and grace that he extends to you. I invite you to make that decision this morning, to believe in Jesus, that by faith you would repent of your sins, confess him as Lord and Savior, and be baptized in his name, and begin living the life that he's calling you to. Begin living in the joy and freedom of that faith as you discover God's will for your life, his purpose, Would you please pray with me? God, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be yours, to practice our faith, to grow in our relationship with you, and to be your love in the world around us. I pray that you would provide those opportunities this week, that you would bring clarity to our thinking to help us identify how you've gifted us and help us recognize those places around us where we can use those gifts for your glory. We thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.